morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Jane Harmon, the President and CEO, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to introduce uh, uh, our first event this morning. First, let me welcome uh, the Wilson Cabinet Co-Chair and former Board Chair, Ambassador Joe Gildenhorn and uh, Kathy, uh, and ambassadors from countries including Jordan, Turkmenistan, and Poland, and others uh, are speakers for the next panel, which will be introduced a bit later. Um, but I have to recognize a former German ambassador to the U.S., uh, Wolfgang Issinger, who is uh, at the moment a distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center. In 1997, my daughter Hillary, I have a Hillary in my own family, then a Princeton senior majoring in politics, picked NATO as her thesis topic. She called her mom, then in my third term in Congress, to get my assessment. So I had to really think about it. NATO expansion had been agreed upon in the 1994 Brussels Declaration, and there was real enthusiasm, certainly in the United States Congress. The Senate voted 89 to 19, that's a very unusual vote these days, in 1998 to ratify the addition of three countries to NATO, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. And 16 countries have now been added through six rounds of enlargement since the end of the Cold War. But there were also skeptics. Tom Friedman, the writer Tom Friedman, who also is a former Wilson scholar, wrote an op-ed last month in which he quoted his 1998 interview with the then 94-year-old George Kennan. Said Kennan, I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. We have signed up to protect a whole series of countries even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. So, segue to 2014 and the urgent challenge to de-escalate conflict and avoid miscalculation <coughs> over events in Ukraine and Russia. NATO expansion is again being scrutinized. Today's topic, into the fold or out in the cold, could not be more timely or fit better with what the Wilson Center does well. Our Kennan Institute, headed by Matt Rajansky, who is sitting in the corner right here, uh, was founded by the Kennan family and boasts over 1,400 scholar alumni, a hundred of which are currently on the ground in Ukraine. And our Global Europe program, headed by Christian Osterman right here, has hundreds of scholar alumni bordering the conflict zone. We have assembled a program today, including former officials from Russia and Poland who were in key roles in 1994, uh, Wolfgang Issinger, who was then director of policy planning at the German Foreign Office, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of NATO, and Wilson Center Global Fellow Cheryl Cross. NewsHour star Margaret Warner, right over there, will moderate. But here to keynote and kick off our conversation is Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, who was elected to the Senate in 1997 and voted for NATO expansion. I checked. Uh, <laughs> after, after his remarks, he will take a few questions from the audience. Secretary Hagel, a close friend, is the first enlisted combat veteran to lead the Department of Defense. And we all know that serving in government at the highest levels is a combat sport. His plate is full with the Afghan drawdown, the pivot to Asia, realignment of missions and resources, and very tough budget constraints. The Russia-Ukraine issue is yet another urgent file, and NATO's capacity and future role are on the line. As a member myself of the Defense Policy Board, I grappled with this issue with our colleagues earlier this week. Minds far brighter than mine are struggling to figure out what the best answers are. And fortunately, my daughter Hillary isn't writing her thesis now, or mom would have very little advice to give her. I also just returned uh, a few minutes ago from a breakfast with German Chancellor Merkel, who was in town to meet with President Obama, Secretary Hagel, and others. It's a very good thing that she's here, and no doubt 
the conversation will center on these topics. Tough issues, tough guy. Ready for the challenge. Educate, educated at the University of Nebraska on the GI Bill, and Nebraska's record last season, football record, was 9-4, to four, less distinguished than the prior years, 11-3. to three. Ouch. But a few touchdowns for U.S. policy right now would be a good thing. So to bring a smile on your face, Chuck, as we welcome you here and look forward to what you have to say, here is a scarf for the... Cornhuskers, go big red. <laughs> Please welcome Chuck Hagel, the 24th Secretary of Defense. There we go. All right. Should I put that on for the presentation? Or? Uh, uh, Jane, uh, thank you. Um, I'm always uh, overwhelmed in your company, but now you have outdone yourself with a special Nebraska Cornhusker scarf. And by the way, the Cornhuskers will have a better season uh, this year. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thanks to uh, the Wilson Center for uh, what you continue to do for our country and world affairs uh, to bring thoughtful analysis and leadership to these tough issues. Uh, the world uh, is complicated, as we all know. Uh, it's not getting any less complicated. Uh, nor is it getting any less dangerous. So uh, your continued contributions and leadership, uh, as well as uh, this institution, are very valuable and important parts to, to our, all of our efforts, global efforts, to find peaceful, wise resolutions to these difficult uh, problems, too. Uh, my friends here who are on the panel, uh, always good to see you, thanks uh, for your continued contributions uh, as well. And for uh, those here who uh, uh, have been in this business of analysis and thinking and writing for many, many years, thank you. And uh, now is no time to stop. Uh, we're going to need everybody more than maybe uh, ever uh, in our lifetimes. As the world expands, opportunities expand, but threats, challenges expand, uh, technology, uh, unprecedented change uh, all over the world. Uh, but it is our time, and we must not fail uh, uh, the world. Uh, as Jane noted, uh, I uh, have known Jane many years. We worked together in the Congress, traveled uh, together, uh, always admiring her judgment and ability and uh, sharp analysis of issues. And in particular, I have uh, always admired and respected in uh, and uh, particularly appreciated her directness. Uh, those of you who know Jane well, and most of you do, uh, know that uh, she's very clear in what she believes and says it very plainly. And um, uh, that isn't altogether bad. And I think uh, if there was ever a time for plain talk in the world today, respectful, respectful of each other and sovereignty, and our interests all over the world. But we have to be clear with each other. And um, Jane has done that, and uh, I think we, we all appreciate that uh, uh, in our leaders. So Jane, thank you. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, this issue. And I know what your theme is this morning. And it's uh, particularly uh, timely as well as valuable. So thank you. The challenges facing NATO today remind us of the enduring need for this historic alliance and what we must do to strengthen it. Sixty-five years ago, after a long debate about America's role in a post-war world, 11 envoys gathered in the Oval Office at the White House to do witness President Truman formally accepting and ratifying the North Atlantic Treaty. In doing so, President Truman broke with prominent voices, as has been noted here this morning, uh, including those uh, prestigious voices of George Keenan. Those voices called for America, uh, in Keenan's words, to relieve ourselves gradually of the basic responsibility for the security of Western Europe. Instead, General Eisenhower arrived in Paris in 1951 as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. 
By 1953, 11 U.S. Air Force wings, five Army divisions, and 50 Navy warships had followed. Militaries of NATO nations began working together. They began working together to integrate North American and European strategy, plans, and forces. America did not make commitments abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Instead, President Truman joined the North Atlantic Treaty because he said he was convinced that NATO would serve as a shield against aggression and the fear of aggression, and thereby let us get on with the real business of government and society at home. Truman joined the North Atlantic Treaty because it was, as he put it, a simple document that if it had existed in 1914 and in 1939, would have prevented two world wars. America was committed to NATO because NATO would help protect vital American interests by reinforcing the unity of transatlantic security. NATO would ultimately protect security and prosperity here at home with this alliance, a truth that I believe endures to this day. On the centennial of the start of World War I, and weeks before the 70th anniversary of Allied landings at Normandy, Russia's recent action in Ukraine has reminded NATO of its founding purpose. It has presented a clarifying moment for the transatlantic alliance. NATO members must demonstrate that they are as committed to this alliance as its founding members were who built it 65 years ago. They must reaffirm the security guarantees at the heart of the alliance. They must reinvigorate the unrivaled joint planning exercises and capabilities that are its lifeblood. And they must reaffirm that from the Mediterranean to the Baltics, allies are allies. Our commitment to the security of every ally is resolute. This moment comes as NATO ends its combat mission in Afghanistan later this year. The longest, most complex operation in its history, and one that has strengthened the capability and the cohesion of the alliance. It also comes as we prepare for a NATO summit this fall in Wales, which will be an opportunity to re-examine how NATO militaries are trained, equipped, and structured to meet new and enduring security challenges. After more than a decade focused on counterinsurgency and stability operations, NATO must balance a renewed emphasis on territorial defense with its unique expeditionary capabilities because, as we have seen, threats to the alliance neither start nor stop at Europe's doorstep. Emerging threats and technologies mean that fewer and fewer places are truly out of area. Balancing a full range of missions will require NATO to have a full range of forces, from high-end systems for deterrence and power projection to special operations and rapid response capabilities. Allied forces must also be ready, deployable, and capable of ensuring our collective security. I said at NATO's defense ministerial meeting earlier this year that we must focus not only on how much we spend, but also on how we spend, ensuring we invest in the right interoperable capabilities for all NATO missions. This will require the United States to continue prioritizing capabilities that can operate across the spectrum of conflict against the most sophisticated adversaries. And it will also require NATO nations, NATO nations to prioritize similar investments in their own militaries. Since the end of the Cold War, America's military spending has become increasingly disproportionate within the alliance. Today, America's GDP is smaller than the combined GDPs of our 27 NATO allies. But America's defense spending is three times our allies' combined defense spending. Over time, this lopsided burden threatens NATO's integrity, cohesion, and capability, and ultimately, both European and transatlantic security. Many of NATO's smaller members have pledged to increase their defense investment, and earlier this week at the Pentagon, I thanked Estonia's defense minister for his nation's renewed commitment and investment in NATO. But the alliance cannot afford for Europe's larger economies and most militarily capable allies not to do the same, particularly as transatlantic economies grow stronger. 
We must see renewed financial commitments from all NATO members. Russia's actions in Ukraine have made NATO's value abundantly clear. And I know from my frequent conversations with NATO defense ministers that they do not need any convincing on this point. Talking amongst ourselves is no longer good enough. Having participated in the NATO defense ministerials over the last year and a half, and having met with all of my NATO counterparts, I've come away recognizing that the challenge is building support, the real challenge, the real challenge is building support for defense investment across our governments, not just in our defense ministries. Defense investments, investment must be discussed in the broader context of member nations' overall fiscal challenges and priorities. Today, I am therefore calling for the inclusion of finance ministers or senior budget officials at a NATO ministerial focused on defense investment. This would allow them to receive detailed briefings from Alliance military leaders on the challenges we all face. Leaders across our governments must understand that the consequences of current trends in reduced defense spending and help will break up the fiscal impasse. In meeting its global security commitments, the United States must have strong, committed, and capable allies. This year's Quadrennial Defense Review makes this very clear. Going forward, the Department of Defense will not only seek, but increasingly rely on closer integration and collaboration with our allies, and in ways that will influence U.S. strategic planning and future investment. For decades, from the early days of the Cold War, American defense secretaries have called on European allies to ramp up their defense investment. And in recent years, one of the biggest obstacles to alliance investment has been a sense that the end of the Cold War ushered in the end of history, an end to insecurity, at least in Europe, an end from aggression by nation states. But Russia's actions in Ukraine shatter that myth and usher in bracing new realities. Even a united and deeply interconnected Europe still lives in a dangerous world. While we must continue to build a more peaceful and prosperous global order, there is no postmodern refuge immune to the threat of military force. And we cannot take for granted, even in Europe, that peace is underwritten by the credible deterrent of military power. In the short term, the transatlantic alliance has responded to Russian actions with continued resolve. But over the long term, we should expect Russia to test our alliance's purpose, stamina, and commitment. Future generations will note whether at this moment, at this moment of challenge, we summon the will to invest in our alliance. We must not squander this opportunity or shrink from this challenge. We will be judged harshly by history and by future generations if we do. NATO should also find creative ways, creative ways to find nations around the world to help them adapt to collective security, to rapidly evolving global strategic landscapes. Collective security is not only the anchor of the transatlantic alliance. It is also a model for emerging security institutions around the world, from Africa to the Persian Gulf to Southeast Asia. I say this having just convened a forum of ASEAN defense ministers last month and having called for a Gulf Cooperation Council defense ministerial this year. These institutions bring all of our peoples, all of our interests, all of our economies closer together serving as anchors for stability, security, and prosperity. Strengthening these regional security institutions must be a centerpiece of America's defense policy as we continue investing in NATO. As these institutions develop their own unique security arrangements, they stand to benefit by learning from NATO's unmatched interoperability in command and control systems. There can be no transatlantic prosperity absent security. But we must also keep in mind that investing in our alliance and our collective security means more than just investing in our militaries alone. It means the United States and Europe must partner together over the long term to bolster Europe's energy security and blunt Russia's coercive energy policies.
By the end of the decade, Europe is positioned to reduce its natural gas imports from Russia by more than 25 percent. And the U.S. Department of Energy has conditionally approved export permits for American liquefied natural gas that add up to more than half of Europe's gas imports from Russia. It means deepening our economic ties through new trade initiatives, like the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And it means continuing to exercise global leadership in defense of shared values like human rights and the rule of law. Let me conclude by reflecting on the historic decision 20 years ago to move toward NATO enlargement, which I know, as Jane has noted, is a focus of this conference. Then as now, some argued that NATO enlargement invited Russian aggression. Critics called it a tragic mistake and an irresponsible bluff. Some still do. But the historical record now speaks clearly for itself. And it makes clear that NATO has sought partnership, not conflict, with Russia. And that enlargement has contributed to stability and security. No one wanted to replace Europe's Cold War dividing line with a new one. So America and its allies made a good faith effort to convince Russia that our security interests were converging. President Clinton urged that, in his words, the measure of Russia's greatness would be whether Russia, the big neighbor, can be the good neighbor. Despite the reservations of many aspiring new members, NATO established the Partnership for Peace and negotiated the NATO-Russia Agreement. Some U.S. government officials went so far as to say that Russia might one day even join the alliance. But even as we pursued cooperation with Russia, we were never blind to the risks. Strobe Talbot, former Deputy Secretary of State, warned in 1995 that in his words, among the contingencies for which NATO must be prepared is that Russia will abandon democracy and return to the threatening patterns of international behavior that have sometimes characterized its history, particularly during the Soviet period. And today, NATO must stand ready to visit the basic principles underlying its relationship with Russia. NATO enlargement did not, did not invite Russian aggression. Instead, it affirmed the independence and democratic identity of new members. It did not foment crisis then or now. Instead, it settled old disputes and advanced regional stability. It promoted freedom and free markets, and it advanced the cause of peace. That is why NATO still holds the door open for aspiring members and why it must maintain partnerships with nations around the world. Consider the alternative, a world without NATO enlargement and the assurances of collective security it provided. That world would have risked the enormous political and economic progress made within and between aspiring members. It would have risked a precarious European security environment in which today's Central and Eastern European allies would be torn between Europe and Russia. It would have risked insecurity reverberating deep into the heart of Western Europe. And ultimately, it would have risked a Europe more fractured and less free. Thanks to American leadership and thanks to some of the distinguished leaders here today that you'll hear from this morning, that is not the world we live in. Yes, the world's dangerous. Yes, the world's imperfect. Yes, we have challenges. But we must reflect on what we have done as we prepare and build platforms and institutions to take on these new threats of the early 21st century. In 1997, I said on the Senate floor that America, Europe, and Russia could all benefit if the nations of Central and Eastern Europe are anchored in the security NATO can offer. Today, the Transatlantic Alliance anchors global security. It offers a powerful antidote to the aggression and fear of aggression that President Truman warned against in 1949. It has spread the rule of law, freedom, stability, and prosperity. And it will endure well into the century and the next century, but only if nations on both sides of the Atlantic seize this clarifying moment. 
Two years and 19 days after General Eisenhower arrived in Paris as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, he was inaugurated as the 34th President of the United States. President Eisenhower was as war-weary as the American public and people all over the world. He had written to his wife, Mamie, in his words, that he constantly wondered how civilization can stand war at all. He would lie awake at night, smoking cigarettes, and he acknowledged privately that there was not one part of his body that did not pain him. But in his first formal address as president, I consisted that America had to remain engaged in the world. He said no nation's security and well-being can be lastingly achieved in isolation, but only in effective cooperation with fellow nations. And in 1957, President Eisenhower returned to Paris, where in his address to the first NATO summit of heads of state, he connected America's transatlantic commitments to the vitality of our factories and mills and shipping, of our trading centers, our farms, our little businesses, and to our rights at home, our rights to produce freely, trade freely, travel freely, think freely, and pray freely. Those who doubt the value of America's commitments abroad should recall that wisdom. Because the unprecedented peace and prosperity we enjoy today was hard won. And we must remember, it is always perishable. As Ike liked to say, it takes a lot of hard work and sacrifice by a lot of people to bring about the inevitable. Without deep engagement in the world, America would face more conflict, not less. And on the terms of our adversaries, not on our own terms. That is why America's commitment to its allies in Europe and around the world is not a burden, or it's not a luxury, but it is a necessity. And it must be unwavering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Hagel, for a uh, uh, remarks that would inspire the Cornhuskers and the entire world. <laughs> uh, we'll now take a few questions from the audience. Please identify yourself, and I suggest uh, that you stand up so we can I we, we know where you are when you're speaking. Questions? Way in the back. Yes. Hi, Meto Koloski, UMD, and uh, I agree with Congresswoman Harmon on your inspirational speech. I wanted to know, especially in light of uh, enlargement in the Balkans, uh, do you predict any sort of uh, efforts being done to resolve those old disputes uh, similar to the Macedonia-Greece uh, dispute, which has prevented the country from joining NATO over the last six years? Thank you. Well, as you all know, um, uh, that's an area of the world that uh, is working its way through uh, difficult historical uh, differences. Uh, you know, I think, everyone here uh, much about those differences. I think the progress that is being made in those countries as they sort through those differences uh, peacefully, uh, imperfect, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, it's a matter of continuing to make progress build functioning, free, democratic institutions, respect all their people, uh, regardless of their religion or, or their ethnic backgrounds. Uh, I think a lot of progress is being made. Um, uh, we, we've seen that, I think, in the definition of, of boundaries of new nation states uh, as they continue to work toward uh, democracy and self-government in uh, responsible ways. So I'm encouraged by that. I do think that uh, NATO, European Union, those alliances have helped uh, that. I referenced uh, generally, not specifically uh, to the Balkans, but generally, 
what uh, I think NATO has meant in my comments regarding uh, we have fostered NATO alliance, European Union. We fostered that coming together and uh, building on common interests, not our differences, but build platforms of common interest. Where do we agree? Where can we both benefit? We have changes and we have differences. We've got that. But we'll never peacefully resolve differences without building institutions and platforms of common interest. It was the whole point behind the coalitions of common interest built after World War II, whether it was the United Nations or NATO, IMF, World Bank, what came out of Bretton Woods, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. All of that was about common interest so that we didn't revert back into a third world war that the third one would probably go a long way in destroying mankind with the sophistication of weapons. So I've, I'm encouraged. More to do, but I'm encouraged. More questions. Anyone up front? There are several in the back. How about in the very back? Let's see. I'm, I can't really see what you're wearing, so I can't describe you. Uh, My name is Galima Galiulina, and I'm a retired Russian professor living here. And uh, I have a question about uh, some historical aspects of relationship between NATO and Russia. Uh, 69 uh, years ago, in May of 1945, our countries together were celebrating victory, a great victory day uh, uh, against fascism. How that's happened that now attitude of America changed uh, to Russia as a country enemy. What happened all these years, during all these years? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think uh, you might want to address that question to some others uh, as to what happened. But um, I would answer your question this way. I said in my, uh, my speech that um, during the process of NATO enlargement, and many of the strong arguments that were made, and I use this as just one example to answer your large question, what happened. Uh, um, all different views about NATO enlargement were presented. I was in the Senate, as I, I noted at the time. Jane was in the House. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this issue, and those of you who were all part of that debate at the time whether it was in Congress or outside, know that there was a tremendous amount of focus and effort put on this, examining all points of view. What were the consequences of enlargement? Should we do it? Uh, Russia's response, uh, as has already been noted here. But um, in my opinion, uh, the, the right decisions were made to go forward with enlargement. Now, during that process, there was a reaching out uh, from NATO members uh, to Russia. I referenced a couple of the specific partnership for peace. We have the Russian uh, NATO uh, meetings. And uh, that was done specifically to recognize that uh, uh, Russia uh, would, uh, I'm sure, think that uh, somehow this was a threat to them, their security. Uh, and uh, you need not go back in history too far to get all that. Uh, and I was not at the center of every decision, but I was in the Senate at the time, on the Foreign Relations Committee at the time, traveled a lot on this issue. And, and I know our government at the time, and I think our allies at the time, um, did reach out to uh, the Russians to try to reassure them that this was about our common interests, not, not about our differences. Um, I think we've had, uh, in the last uh, 20 years, especially since the implosion of the Soviet Union, we've had ups and downs in the, uh, the, the Russia-U.S. relationship, NATO-Russia relationship. But we've had periods of cooperation as well. We do a lot of things with the Russians. Um, uh, and uh, we have differences. Obviously, what's happened in Ukraine, as I made clear, at least in my opinion, in my speech, uh, that, that was not uh, NATO aggression that brought those actions on. And um, so uh, we'll continue to uh, uh, do what civilized nations must do, protect their own interests, but also to find wise, uh, diplomatic, smart uh, resolutions to, uh, to differences. But uh, I, I think my remarks were pretty clear here on, on uh, where I think the responsibility lies uh, in this particular case.
Last question in front, right here. Mr. Secretary, I am Bronislaw Mistal. I am the Polish ambassador to Portugal on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I very much appreciated your comments, and as you may gather, being positioned in Lisbon, we look at the Atlantic from a very strategic position. Uh, just yesterday, I had a conversation with one of your lustrous uh, predecessors, with Frank Carucci. And uh, uh, you would gather without much effort that we, we spoke about mostly the same that you did today. Um, since this was a private conversation, I'm not going to get into it, but it went slightly differently. Uh, for Poland, the question, of course, is uh, that NATO has been one of our major diplomatic accomplishments, membership in NATO. And uh, back 20 years ago, the former Polish Prime Minister, Mr. Cimosiewicz, is present here, and we, all, uh, we both remember how it went at that time. This was something unbelievable. This is something that uh, created completely new opportunities for us. It was meant to be the guarantee of our uh, security in international dimension. But it was also, and, and until today, the public opinion polls in Poland indicate that about 60% of Poles believe that in case of any danger, this is NATO that is going to, to support and defend us. However, I believe that uh, what has changed is that the very concept on which NATO was operating has changed. Uh, for many years, I would say this was a concept of, of the prisoner's game dilemma, presuming that you have two people that are uh, sort of locked in the same jail, and then they, they, whether they will cooperate or not, they would have to resolve it. Now I believe the question is that one of those uh, entities is no longer in the same in the same jail and is acting in a different way, logically. And I believe that this requires completely new strategic concept. My question is, how would you address it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very simple question. Um, <laughs> so you deserve a simple answer. I, uh, I uh, noted in my remarks that we have um, a uh, NATO summit of heads of state coming up in September. Uh, this obviously, your question and everything that revolves around it will be much the centerpiece of that agenda for uh, obvious uh, reasons. Um, I referenced on, um, on a number of occasions in, in more general terms in my, my remarks, as you know, uh, about uh, strategic shifts and allies and commitments and not only uh, financial commitments but but other uh, strategic issues that uh, and I mentioned specifically the relationship with Russia uh, all of this is going to have to be uh, re-examined institutions uh, don't uh, ever nor does life nor do any of us in this room stay status quo yesterday's gone uh, we each get a day older uh, so on and so on. Institutions are the same way. Institutions must remain relevant to the challenge. And that's much of the theme of my point here uh, today, as we all know. Relevant to address the, the challenges that are before us and we anticipate will be in the future. Uh, that's constantly reassessment of strategic interest assets, uh, uh, the strength of alliances, the strength of uh, all of a nation's assets, not just their military, because you, we all know you, you can't separate security and stability from prosperity. You, you, you can't have one without the other. And um, so, yes, we'll, we are going through that process, but I think in a world that is so hair-triggered as we are living in today, where there's very little margin of bad, for bad decisions, margin of error, not like it was 20 years ago, certainly 40, 50 years ago. Um, so we have to be very wise, steady, firm, but wise in how we employ our tremendous powers, uh, thinking not just about today, but about tomorrow. How does this all work out? Uh, where do we want to end up before we commit anything to anything? And that is going to require more and more alliance relationships. Uh, every nation will respond in its own self-interest. We know that. That's predictable. Um, and, and no nation should be held captive to an institution they belong to. Uh, 
uh, every nation must protect its own interests. Uh, but those in interests are now wide and varied where they uh, include mutual interests, which again I referenced uh, our wise leaders on both sides of the Atlantic after World War II understood that. That's why we built these great institutions. Imperfect, flawed, can't solve every problem. We haven't. But let's, let's examine the record here. I mean, you expand this out about strategic thinking and where do we go from here to your question. Uh, we haven't done too badly in 65 years. There's not been a World War III, not been a nuclear ex exchange. Um, I think on balance, probably the, there are more nations with more possibilities for freedom and opportunities and trade. Uh, still a lot to do, absolutely. But as imperfect and flawed and many mistakes as, as we make, governments make, we all make, uh, on balance we shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss what's gone right and how we built the right things. But it's a constant evaluation of strategic interests and uh, we very much appreciate uh, what uh, your country is doing and continues to do, especially in the NATO uh, relationship. Uh, Frank Carlucci is a very dear friend. I know uh, I have often said, and uh, uh, Frank thinks that I uh, exaggerate, former senators never exaggerate, you know, uh, that uh, if it hadn't been for Frank Carlucci, I'm not sure Portugal would have turned out in that immediate time the way it did in 1980 and 1979. Frank Carlucci is, a, is an amazing individual and one of the great public servants of our time. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Secretary Hagel. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank the, you very much. The next part of our program begins right now. of Diana Davis Spencer here this morning. I hope all of you will join us for the Davis dinner in less than two weeks. There are invitations and brochures on the table outside. The mission of the Kennan Institute is to support deep mutual understanding among thought leaders in the United States, Russia, Ukraine, and the surrounding states. That is a mission, I think you'll agree, more urgently compelling now than ever before. Since the 1990s, Kennan has hosted over 500 thought leaders from Russia and Ukraine as visiting scholars. Some have published prize-winning scholarly books and novels. Others returned home to serve in the most senior levels of government. Most have been responsible for shaping the next generation's perceptions of Russia in America and vice versa. Recently, Kennan joined forces with the Kettering Foundation to re revive and reimagine the Dartmouth Conference the leading second track for U.S.-Russian dialogue since 1960, when it was created at the urging of both Eisenhower and Khrushchev. So I'm proud today to say that today's exceptionally distinguished panel represents only a part of what Kennan and the Wilson Center have to contribute to deeper mutual understanding and through that to shared security. 
Now I'll introduce Margaret Warner, who will moderate the discussion. Margaret is the chief foreign correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Her reporting has taken her to every news hotspot in the world, Russia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Egypt, Yemen, and China, to name just a few of the stamps that I'm sure are in her passport, extended pages included. Before joining the PBS NewsHour in 1993, Margaret was a political and campaign correspondent, White House reporter, and chief diplomatic correspondent at Newsweek. And she also reported for the Wall Street Journal and the San Diego Union Tribune. Her reporting on turmoil in Pakistan won her an Emmy Award in 2008. And at Newsweek, she was part of a team of journalists to share the prestigious George Polk Award for their coverage on terrorism. Last month, most importantly to me, she spent two weeks reporting directly from Ukraine, including Crimea, where she saw the renewed security challenges for the region, including for the US, Russia, and the NATO alliance, up close and personal. So it's my pleasure to welcome Margaret Warner to the Wilson Center this morning and to leave this distinguished panel in her capable hands. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Matthew, very much. And welcome to you all who've been here. And I understand we also have an overflow room. Uh, as, as uh, Jane Harmon and Secretary uh, Hagel iterated this morning, I will just remind you that, that we are here to look at really 20 years ago, this fateful decision was taken in January of 94, which was at a, at a NATO summit, which was to offer something called a partnership for peace to, to <coughs> Russia, all former Warsaw Pact states, anyone that would like to have a closer relationship with NATO. Now, as everybody on this panel, whom I will uh, introduce in a minute, knows at the time, Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary were all clamoring for NATO membership. So this was actually a compromise suggested by the Clinton administration. Uh, but sure enough, beginning in about 97, NATO started offering membership first to those three countries. And today, of course, it is 12 countries larger than it was, the 16 members it was at the time. Uh, now, this obviously sticks in President Putin's craw. In his four-hour telethon, I don't know how many of you watched this a couple of weeks ago, he talked about it uh, repeatedly. He said, we were promised that after Germany's unification, NATO wouldn't spread eastward. He went on to say, but they started expanding, incorporating former Warsaw Treaty member countries. When we said, what do, why are you doing this, we heard in response, this doesn't concern you. Nations and countries have the right to choose a way of ensuring their own security. And he said, right, that's true, but it's also true that when the infrastructure of a military bloc approaches our borders, we have grounds for apprehension and questions, and we must take certain steps. And no one can deny us this right. He went on to say how NATO and Western leaders had lied to the Russians many times, made decisions behind their back, and placed before us an accomplished fact, and that that is what happened with NATO expansion. So today we want to examine whether NATO and the newly uh, expanded NATO alliance, that is, over the last 20 years, is now reaping the whirlwind of that decision in Ukraine. And we have a very distinguished panel of, of, of people here today who are essentially present at the creation in one way or another. You all have biographies in the program, but I'll just briefly, <coughs> this, uh, the former <coughs> foreign minister and then, uh, actually first prime minister and then foreign minister of, of Poland, uh, uh, I'm going to mangle your first name, but Wodimez Cimoshevich, uh, on my immediate left. He was uh, prime minister of Poland in 97 when, in fact, uh, Poland was first invited to join uh, uh, NATO. Uh, next is Andrzej Kozirev, who was the foreign minister actually at the waning days of the Soviet Union and then all the way from 91 through 96 of Russia and was deeply involved in this entire drama. Uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, oh, Wolfgang, I'm so sorry. I thought it was going to be <laughs> Cheryl there. Wolfgang Ischinger, uh, who many of you knew as ambassador to the United States for many years in the 2000s. But he was on the policy planning staff in the German Foreign Office, a very distinguished diplomat. And as I recall, during the unification of, of NATO discussions, deeply involved in, in all of this. Uh, Cheryl Cross who is now director of the Kosmetsky Center at St. Edwards University in Austin, was, I think for 20 years, you were at the uh, George Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany, and, and a, a close student of everything from the Partnership for Peace to Russian and Western relations. And finally, on remote, Jamie Shea, a very familiar 
face to many of us, certainly who covered the Kosovo War. Uh, uh, Mr. Shea has been at NATO, a British citizen at NATO, for many, many years in a lot of important positions, including, I think, you were director of policy planning in 94, if I'm not mistaken, but is best known, perhaps, as an ever-present spokesman for NATO, explaining what NATO was doing, especially throughout the 90s and the early 2000s, to a worldwide audience. So let me just start, and I'm going to start with Ambassador Ischinger, actually. Let's go back to um, this decision, this fateful decision in, in January of 94 to begin this partnership for peace. Was it folly, as many critics suggested at the time, as, as uh, Ms. Ms. Harmon said, from George Kennan to Tom Friedman and others in between? Or in fact, has what's happened in Ukraine proved that it was prescient and necessary? Margaret, uh, thank you for bringing us all together here. I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, my view is that, you know, if one imagined a world in which we had not taken these decisions in 94 and then, um, you know, going forward a few years, the first round of NATO enlargement, where in fact Poland was invited in and two other countries. Uh, and subsequent enlargement rounds. If we had not done that, what kind of chaos could possibly exist in Europe today? Uh, we would have continuing or even new lines of division in Europe. The very idea was that how could we resist the uh, interest, the claim, uh, the aspiration of uh, newly independent countries like our immediate neighbor to the east, Poland, who said, can we be part of your club? What would have legitimized us to say no to that? Uh, if we wanted to create, over time, a Europe whole and free and united. Uh, so I think it was actually without alternative. The question is, did we use the right method steps uh, did we communicate perfectly with our Russian, uh, first Soviet, then Russian uh, uh, partners? That is a big question. But I believe the decision in 94 and then subsequently in 97 was absolutely without alternative. It was a historically necessary decision. And Minister Kozarev, how was it seen in Russia at the time? And, and, and how would you answer that, that question? Uh, I would answer uh, today as I answered at uh, that time. Uh, and basic, uh, um, I would like to answer also the question of uh, one of my Russian compatriots uh, about the V-Day, because it's actually the time of, for the V-Day. Uh, we, we celebrate it in Russia on May 9, and uh, in, in the West it's usually uh, May 8. So what happened after that? Basically, what, and that's a part of, of the answer to your question. What happened after that, that Stalin remained in power and the system uh, which ignited and uh, participated in aggression against Poland in 1993 and 1939 together with Hitler, that system in Russia, in Soviet Union, remained. And that was the course of the uh, Cold War instead of United Nations in proper terms, uh, not in technical terms of the word. And then uh, what happens today, uh, the, the main problem is that Russia uh, has not yet parted with this past. Stalin is referred to in government approved or endorsed actually textbooks for our children as an able operator, as an able manager. Could you believe uh, what would have happened in Germany if Hitler was referred to as able manager? So that's basically what happened. 
and that's basically the <coughs> root of the problem today with Ukraine, that part of Russian um, establishment is still there. And you know what happened, which, which I didn't know in uh, 1994, that uh, Russian elite, actually ruling class, those who benefited the most, who privatized uh, actually the results of the democratic revolution of 1991. And I haven't seen any of those in the so-called White House when we were standing against the coup on August 19, 1991. But they were quick to privatize uh, actually the cash flow from the uh, oil and gas exports, which is still the base of economy. And they mostly moved to NATO zone themselves. That's amazing that the <laughs> Russian elite today is mostly based in the NATO zone. So that's the answer to the question. <laughs> yes, NATO. Uh, Poland expanded uh, a joint NATO as a country. Russian elite joint NATO, but left uh, Russia to the post-Soviet kind of propaganda. And that's what we are facing today. And let me ask the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the former prime minister. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I and mean, it's, it's very painful for me to say these things. At the time, in 94, was Poland bitterly disappointed, or did you always think this was going to be a backdoor way, this was going to morph into eventual pathway to NATO membership, even though at the time it was painted in a different fashion? I, I, I will uh, be very frank. In that moment, we were very disappointed. Uh, to explain that, uh, I, let me tell you what was the reason for which we applied for NATO membership uh, soon after the collapse of Soviet Union. As we know, that happened in December 91, and for the first time, uh, members of Polish government uh, began talking about uh, NATO membership in February, March uh, 92. Uh, of course, there was a variety of reasons, but probably, at least in my opinion, a dominating one was that we were afraid of potential instability in Russia. And that was, for instance, confirmed by Yanais Kudeta. Later on, that was confirmed by the way that political conflict between President Yeltsin and Duma was solved uh, with use of tanks shelling uh, the building of parliament. So we were afraid of weakness and instability in Russia. And eventual consequences of potential conflicts uh, that already erupted in many places of former Soviet Union. That is why we were interested in fast joining, early joining NATO. But uh, yes, I can also say today very openly that, uh, of course, that there was a lot of naivety in our way of thinking because we believed that that was almost 100% political decision. We did not understand at early stage how much we had to do ourselves to prepare for, for instance, our army, our personnel, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in 94, we reacted with disappointment, believing that that was offered us instead of NATO membership. And that, that was a kind of uh, trick, not fair to us. But from the perspective, I can say that was a very wise decision. We really had to do a lot, which we later on found, understood. We did our homework pretty well, and that, that is why we could then become, I believe, credible and reliable uh, ally. Let me go to Jamie Shea, because you were there at the time. Inside the inner councils at NATO, was it seen as, as many American political figures portrayed it, and Secretary Hagel did too, as something that would afford, quote, independence and the democratic identity of the new members, help them solve their various disputes between them and on their borders, and or was it still aimed at least part of the objective that it would bolster Europe's defense against a possibly resurgent Russia? 
Well, Margaret, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the Wilson Centre for allowing me to appear through the magic of a VTC rather than to be present with you in Washington. I'm grateful. Uh, the first thing to say is that NATO did not proceed with enlargement, which happened, as we all know, only uh, in 1999, several years after the end of the Cold War, until we had striven to put in place a comprehensive all European, Euro-Atlantic security system, which included Russia. Uh, for example, Wolfgang Ischinger rightly mentioned that we did not try to see NATO enlargement as NATO expanding eastwards, pushing itself eastwards, uh, but very much as responding to the legitimate aspirations of Central and Eastern European countries at the end of the Cold War to be part of the Euro-Atlantic family if it had worked so well for us for so many years, why would we refuse them the legitimate aspiration to be part of that? But we didn't rush into this. Uh, as the Prime Minister uh, referred to, first of all, of course, the countries themselves had to demonstrate that they looked upon NATO membership not just as a way of receiving passively protection, but that they were willing to help to share the burdens of membership, that they were up to that through a process of reform. For example, by the time that NATO enlargement happened, Margaret, as you know, NATO had become deeply involved in so-called out-of-area operations, well beyond the traditional Article 5 collective defence, particularly in Bosnia, and peacekeeping and supporting the United Nations. So the countries that wanted to join NATO had to understand that it was a two-way street, that they not only would uh, receive protection, but also had to contribute to uh, NATO extending that protection to, to others. The second thing, which I think we really have to remember, is before NATO enlarged, we had a negotiation with Russia. I participated very actively in this, and Wolfgang, I know, will also remember this uh, very well at the time. Uh, uh, the Secretary General, Hadi Solana, negotiated for months with Yevgeny Prima the, Russia, uh, the Russian foreign minister, uh, on the NATO-Russia founding act and the establishment of the permanent joint council to make it clear that before we enlarged, we were not doing this against Russia, but we're embracing Russia. And that we saw this not as a sort of either or, but a way of bringing Russia uh, closer to, to NATO and giving Russia a seat at the table uh, and a voice in all of this. So the partnership for peace, if you like, put together the outer framework in which everybody participated. And once we, we, this was in place, then we could go forward with NATO membership. But what was it about? Just very briefly, and then I'll stop. It was all about not repeating uh, the 20th century and even the 19th century in Europe, uh, where uh, the small countries had to limit their sovereignty and their foreign policy independence because they were wedged between two large countries, where your geography determined your fate, your history were, was uh, bound to be re repeated. Uh, for example, one of the reasons why NATO came about, NATO enlargement came about, frankly, was because some of the earlier ideas, like President Mitterrand of France's idea for a confederation in, uh, in, in Europe struck people as sort of going back to the very loose League of Nations style collective security of the 1930s where everybody is responsible for everybody else's security and therefore nobody is secure. Uh, and quite rightly in Central and Eastern European uh, countries there was a, a natural rebellion politically against that kind of idea of being in a glassy or a, a second class citizen's uh, zone. But the point I want to make is that we didn't rush into this. We did this very cautiously and deliberately in full transparency with Russia and bringing Russia in uh, uh, as we went as we as we went along and that has to be remembered and Cheryl Cross because you were observing all of this and talking to all of these people how much thought was given to potential blowback from Russia in other words was from your observation point there was there really a sincere desire or at least uh, intention that if Russia evolved in a certain way, that it could become part of this community, or or not? Well, as J Jamie Shea has indicated, I think there's a consistent record on the part of NATO in beginning in, in really the, with the first visit of the Secretary General uh, before even the collapse of the Soviet Union to Moscow to reach out to Russia in a spirit of cooperation. And that's remained the case, I think, in terms of NATO's approach to Russia, they have the partnership with Russia, the permanent joint council uh, negotiating forum initially, and then the NATO-Russia council. So I think that it's sincere in, the, uh, w in terms of the understanding on the part of NATO countries that in fact uh, Europe's security and many issues in global security requires cooperation from the Russian Federation. And that working out the challenges in that relationship going forward would be important. 
I'm a proponent of NATO enlargement. I've just returned from almost a decade on the other side of the Atlantic where we, I've been working and engaged in uh, with the new democracies. And I can't imagine uh, what the circumstances would have been in terms of the practical support in defense transformation and democratic development without the institutions of the European Union and NATO. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that it's reasonable uh, on the part of Moscow, given NATO's history, to be concerned about NATO's movement increasingly to Russia's borders. So no matter how many assurances were offered on the part of Western nations over the last period, many just don't accept that. And there's been consistent opposition, first by Mikhail Gorbachev and then Russian leadership to NATO's enlargement eastward. So I think the challenge remains, given the, the vast array of common security interests and the importance of that security relationship, that we have to anticipate. And I think Ukraine, in many ways, the situation was predictable because the Russians have talked about consistently that they sort of draw this line and, uh, you know, they, we could go only so far. And they're very nervous and concerned about Ukraine's ties with the Western nations. It's too bad that it's turned into a contest where countries like Ukraine and Montenegro and other aspiring uh, nations wanting to move closer to the Euro-Atlantic community have to now make a choice when really the best and wisest strategy for their long-term uh, uh, success and democratization and economic well-being would be to pursue ties both with Russia and their eastern neighbors and in the West. You wanted to jump in here, Ambassador Ishing. Yeah, I would, I would just like to add a, a German view on, you know, why we did what we did in the 90s and how it came about. When some of us in the German government proposed to move forward on NATO enlargement, on inviting the first group of countries, Chancellor Helmut Kohl at the time hesitated. I remember a meeting where he said, don't do anything. I need to talk to my friend Boris first. And then he came back and said, we will have to do this in a kind of a two-pillar arrangement. There can be a pillar, let's call it the NATO enlargement pillar, but there's got to be an equally, you know, substantial pillar that we can call the NATO-Russia pillar. And let's build these two pillars simultaneously. Let's change the relationship between NATO and Russia as we invite new members. That's a way to keep everybody maybe not happy but, but, but tolerant and to, and to uh, deal with the concerns that you, Cheryl, uh, just mentioned and which certainly were um, legitimate concerns. Second observation, you know, when I look at the debate <coughs> we're having today in Moscow, but also here in the West, we seem to be falling behind what we were talking about uh, in the mid-90s. I mean, during the first Clinton administration, I recall, we had a bit of a debate. Would it make sense to invite NATO, uh, to invite Russia to become, over time, a member of NATO? Later on, in, uh, as I recall, uh, 12, 13 years ago, around 2001, that question was raised again. Now, obviously the Russian response was, we are not really interested in being a member of NATO, but we're interested in a changed relationship. Russia, of course, went even further and came back to us more recently with a whole new concept for the relationship between um, the West and Russia for European security. But some of the ideas that were put forward by President Medvedev during his uh, uh, tenure as, as President of Russia simply, in our view, were not designed to be acceptable to all uh, in the West. They, it was just not going to work. So I think, to finish, uh, we have reached a point where hopefully once the dust has settled of this Ukrainian, uh, awful Ukrainian crisis, we will need to take a, a sharp look again at how we can over time construct an, a European order 
a European security architecture, as we like to call it, that is good for us, <laughs> but also okay for Russia. Let me just ask Andre Kozorov to weigh in but before we jump ahead, which I want to, to Ukraine and what we do afterwards. Is, was there a feeling that the West was taking advantage of Russia at a time of weakness? I mean, in the early 90s, the, the economy, uh, the internal si political situation was really quite chaotic. Is there still a feeling that, that the West was moving ahead in a way because it could afford to ignore Russia's concerns? It's very difficult to speak uh, for any country as a whole. You know, if you speak for Republicans and Democrats, you will probably find uh, many different answers. But it's even much more, unfortunately, Russia is split country. So if you speak of a people with democratic and those <coughs> who were in government like myself on a wave uh, of democratic movement in Russia in at the beginning of 90s. That was the window of opportunity for Russia to really part uh, with the, but uh, it was revolutionary and it should be revolutionary because it's fundamental change from Stalin's, basically Stalin's si system to a democratic system. And in this window of opportunity, NATO uh, was very uh, much in the center of the problem. And uh, I cannot agree more with the ambassador that, uh, yes, uh, we wanted uh, to use this window of opportunity, which closed, unfortunately, uh, by, uh, very soon. Uh, not because of NATO, answering your question. It closed basically because of domestic uh, um, tendencies in Russia that we, our government, Gaidars, my and uh, uh, early Yeltsin government, we were unable to fulfill the promise of democratic change. Uh, and the West, not NATO, but the West could have helped us with a kind of Marshall Plan, but that required much more political focus and resource to actually seize the moment and help Russia. And I was the one to advocate it. And it's absolutely uh, correct. And I was at all those meetings, uh, on almost all those meetings with Helmut Kohl, when Yeltsin told him very clearly, yes, we need uh, Russia first with NATO to avoid the commotion, to avoid all those those difficulties. So that was our concept, Russia first. And that's why we were against speedy or hasty, as we call that, expansion, so to say, or a joining by Poland of NATO. So my formula and Yeltsin formula at that time was yes to partnership with NATO, fundamental, strategic partnership and no to hasty in, uh, enlargement because we were fearful that we will be left uh, alone, you know, left in the cold, uh, so we wanted. But the problem of Russia-NATO is, of course, much more difficult, uh, with all due respect, than the problem of uh, other countries in Eastern Europe, including Ukraine, even, and Georgia. Uh, the problem is that Russia is a nuclear superpower. It was nuclear superpower, and it is still nuclear superpower. And uh, <clears throat> we are still targeted by uh, Russian missiles, even as we speak. Uh, that's a very important point. And when you are... Uh, by U.S. missiles? I mean, Russia no, Russia. Targeted. When we are speaking when now, are speaking oh. now <laughs> I am targeted by my own missiles. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to be sure. So, it's it sounds funny, but, but it is I don't feel it. It's it's funny because I know the missiles, and when you are in the government in Russia, you have to take into account. And uh, my constituency, I was. Uh, 
at that Duma, I was at those first um, elections when there were elections, and I had 14 contenders. In Murmansk area, which you uh, know is still the naval base for Russian strategic fleet, that's where the submarines are and the missiles on the submarines. So I, when, when you um, run at the elections in a uh, naval base, actually, in, in Murmansk area, you have to, ca uh, to meet the officers and uh, the, this large army, which cannot be member of NATO, at least immediately, or probably not any uh, any time, and we have China, and we have different geography, so it was much more difficult task than just becoming a member, and it's still much more difficult task. But I have to uh, agree with President Putin a little bit that in technical terms, in technical terms, there is some truth to what he says. Like basically, it was problem of Russia not reforming enough. But technically, the negotiations with NATO were largely mishandled by our NATO partners because they failed. It took me two years to uh, actually argue with um, Warren Christopher, who was then my counterpart in the United States, so that he started to concentrate on that problem, really, that Russia, even invited to join NATO as a, as a new member, could not do that and probably cannot do it now, even if it is, even if it was, and even if it, it would be today, a fully democratic country, just because of that geography and everything. So it's much more difficult. But it was not addressed. And when he started to address that, uh, in 1995, believe it or not, it was probably already too late because the domestic, uh, and if you are more interested in, in details of all that, I uh, read my memoirs, which <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, somebody, maybe somebody would be uh, interested in publishing my memoirs, and you will learn a lot how those negotiations were uh, proceeding. So in technical terms, we had a lot of uh, promises, and you, I tell you that empty promises, both of economic help and of uh, negotiating uh, real problems rather than just general discussion. Let me let me just is, jump in. Is, here. is is even worse. Is is probably empty uh, promises are even worse probably than empty threats. L let's jump to the present and Ukraine and the kind of challenge that Ukraine, the situation there presents to NATO. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, what would you say? I, I mean, what? It, what kind of a challenge is this for NATO? What can NATO possibly do about what's happening in Ukraine, if anything? I, I, I have no doubt that this is a really very serious uh, situation. Uh, a threat to peace in Europe uh, is back uh, after over two decades when we believed that finally we got into a safe place on, on the earth. And um, uh, I think that uh, 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 Democratic West uh, has so far not reacted uh, in a proper way, proportional way, effective way. And that, that is a risky tactics uh, because if we do not stop uh, that aggressive uh, policy at early stage, then we can face a uh, much more difficult situation requiring uh, more efforts, uh, more risks, uh, uh, taking more risks, uh, high risks, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, Mr. Ishinger and you used such a form, what after? solving the crisis uh, you, with U or Ukrainian crisis. And uh, I ask myself, what do you mean by solving Ukrainian crisis? What does it mean, solving U Ukrainian crisis? There is one element of that crisis. I can imagine, of course, easing tensions nowadays in Eastern Ukraine. But there is one element of that crisis which will be very difficult to be solved. The fate of Crimea, the future of Crimea. That is a part of a, a Ukrainian state, country, that was stolen 
uh, illegitimately by an aggressor. If we really believe in a rule of law, if we really are serious about values and principles of international law and so on, we have no other option than to say Crimea must be uh, given back, returned to Ukraine. And I understand, of course, that uh, it seems to be almost unrealistic. But uh, we have to find answer to that question. Uh, and, uh, and that is why, you know, it is... It is j just one sentence. Uh, uh, of course, NATO has uh, to react, at least in, in that sense, that the security reality in Europe uh, became different. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the most important answer should be given in another area, L economy. L let me bring in Jamie Shea here. So, I mean, looking at it, covering this, it does appear that other than trying to reassure our our the Article 5 covered member states, that there's really very little NATO as an organization can do or is willing to do to uh, assist Ukraine. Is that right? Uh, no, it, it, it's not, Margaret. Uh, let, let me make it clear. I think there are four aspects to dealing with this crisis, and they all have to be interrelated and work together. The first thing is NATO, as the Prime Minister said, is doing uh, its utmost in successfully to reassure the uh, new member states uh, although they're not so new, of course, any longer. Many of them have been in NATO for uh, 15 years already. That we are uh, serious about uh, Article 5, Collective Defense Reassurance. United States has played its role, sending aircraft, uh, uh, sending uh, 600 uh, troops for exercises, incre increasing our visibility uh, in the air, on land uh, and, at, and at sea. So to make it clear, Secretary Hagel pointed this out, that we take the uh, defense of allies very seriously uh, indeed, and to restore, to the extent it needs restoring deterrence. That's, that's number one. So at least we can put limits to how far this crisis can go, at least in geographical terms. Number two, there's a lot we can do to help Ukraine. We can't do it alone. The country is in bad shape economically in terms of governance, uh, corruption, uh, political unity. Uh, it has elections coming up. Uh, everybody needs to do their utmost uh, to uh, improve the resilience of Ukraine. Uh, to, to resist the sort of pressures that it's under at the moment uh, from uh, Russia on a continuous basis. But we can certainly play a role, we're going to play a role, a big one, uh, in terms of helping to revitalize, to reform, to restructure uh, the Ukrainian uh, armed forces. It's not going to happen overnight, but that work has started. The third thing we can do, and we're doing this, is to make it clear to Russia that there are consequences for the outrageous uh, things that have happened. I mean, certain Russian interlocutors were sort of giving me the impression after the annexation of Crimea that uh, we would, they would wait two or three weeks, the whole thing would blow over, and we would go back to business as, 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 as usual because uh, we have too many interests, economic or otherwise, in not having business as usual. But so far, I think the international community, US, the European Union, the United Nations, everybody, has shown remarkable consistency in making it clear to Russia that the sanctions, although maybe mild at the beginning, are now going up and up and up. Uh, and indeed, the Russian economy is starting to feel the impact. I was fascinated by what uh, Minister Kozirev said a moment ago about the Russian elite not living in Russia any longer. I was in London yesterday and I spent a couple of hours in a bookstore where the entire full floor had been taken over by uh, Russian uh, books, Russian language books, because there are so many Russians that are living in London that this uh, uh, bookstore, Waterstones, believes that that is an economically viable uh, thing to do. Uh, there are millions of Russians now living outside Russia. Russia has benefited enormously in terms of living standards uh, and in the improvement of people's lives from being connected uh, to Europe and the United States and to the international trading system. In the wake of the crisis, the the ruble has uh, lost uh, about 10% of its value. Russian growth this year is heading downwards towards the zero point. The Secretary Hegel very eloquently addressed the energy issues. And yes, I know in the short term, obviously, President Putin may feel uh, empowered or, or strengthened on the wave of sort of uh, nationalist emotion. But I think it's not going to be very long before the average Russian will start assessing his or her uh, well-being and future prospects, the impact of this isolation. Uh, so the economic factor should not be underestimated here. The fourth and final thing, and I apologize for speaking at length, but the fourth and final thing is what we're doing in NATO is we're keeping the door open. So is the European Union. We, we haven't uh, cancelled the NATO-Russia Council. We haven't torn up 
uh, the NATO-Russia founding act or the, the Rome Declaration. Uh, Russia is still integrated into Europe. And this, this is the, the thing that I want to get across. The, when the Russians talk about NATO enlargement, they talk about something that, that sort of excluded them from Europe. But the Russians are in the OSCE. The Russians are part of the Council of Europe. They have a separate dialogue with the European Union. They're in the G8. Before the crisis, they were about to join the Organization for Economic Cooperation in and development. So the Russians are very firmly integrated, uh, and we are keeping those mechanisms of cooperation for what Wolfgang Ischinger was rightly calling the future European security architecture open, hoping that sooner or later either President Putin or, or the Russian government or the Russian elite will come to its senses and realize that the path they've chosen may procure a kind of short term thrill of, ex of nationalist exuberance, but in the long run, it's going to see a Russia going into severe decline and uh, severe loss of global influence. Um, President Putin has asserted the right of Russia to intervene to protect the rights of ethnic Russians anywhere, and there are NATO member states, let's take Estonia, that have a lot of ethnic Russians uh, in some of the Baltic states. Is there any doubt in the mind of anyone at this, in this gathering that if Russia were to invade or even try to destabilize, as, as it's done both in Crimea and now in eastern Ukraine, one of the NATO member states that, that an Article 5 mutual defense, full-throated defense, would be the reaction from NATO? I strongly okay. believe that, that there will be, but uh, the problem is that a big part of the public, public opinion, uh, is uh, not, not, not shares the same, let's say, belief and confidence. Cheryl? Yes, I, I think that uh, that they could be sure and we need to keep uh, the signals very clear and unambiguous in that respect with Moscow. But you're right. I mean, there's still concern in the publics. And I think that... Are you talking about the publics in these potential target countries? Or you mean... I think writ large across East Central Europe and those countries close to Russia's border. The other part of this is that if you look at the complex sort of strategy that uh, Moscow's employed in Crimea and in Ukraine, uh, there, it becomes much less clear what constitutes an invasion or exactly. it's measures a to destabilize? Exactly. So these are issues that will have to be discussed at NATO and considered, and, and uh, I think present certain challenges in, in working through uh, at what point the response would be employed and in what form. And what about public opinion in countries like the U.S. or Germany, Ambassador Ischinger? I mean, would the German public support a military response if Russia were to attempt? a sort of Eastern Ukraine kind of destabilization campaign in, in one of these uh, NATO member states? Uh, no. Uh, the clear answer is no. I don't think the U.S. public would support a military response. President Obama himself has ruled out a military response. NATO has not. But that's to Ukraine, though. I'm talking about if this same scenario Versus were to be followed in Estonia. a NATO oh. state, like, NATO, like oh. Estonia. Oh, then I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. Of course. Uh, of course, that would be a totally different ballgame. If we're talking about uh, Article 5, if we're talk about, talking about the members of NATO, the, then we're really in serious uh, territory. But, uh, and I, I think in that case, there would be no doubt that we would need to uh, come up with determined action and, and at that moment should not rule out even military responses. But let me say this. Uh, I think as we look at the situation today, it's important to remind ourselves that Demonizing President Putin as um, as 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 um, uh, unnecessary and as terrible we may find his decisions, demonizing President Putin and imposing sanctions and against Russia alone does not amount to a strategy. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we need is a strategy, and one element one element uh, it would take longer time than we have here. But one element, one priority item, in my view, of a strategy is to understand that our first purpose at this moment ought to be to make sure that Ukraine can be turned, hopefully over time, it won't happen at the push of a button, from what is essentially a rather dysfunctional state into a functioning state. 
into a prosperous state, into a stable state. We, it will require a lot of money. The EU has already devoted 11 billion just now. The United States has made some uh, resources available. We will probably need a whole lot more. Uh, we will need to help Ukraine politically, economically, uh, and in, in many other ways than just the military issue. So I think that's important. Second observation, you know, I don't need to explain to this audience uh, how many times over the last decade or so we have allowed ourselves, I mean Americans and Europeans, Germans and Americans, to be split uh, in the management of crises. Remember Iraq? <laughs> I was here as ambassador and suffered through that one. Uh, remember Libya? Uh, I believe so far we can actually be quite proud that even though there are different views here and there, both within the EU and between the EU and the US, we have managed to, to, to keep things together. I believe we would be offering a victory on a silver platter to President Putin if he allowed us, either within the EU or, w or in the transatlantic uh, community, to be divided about our response. And um, um, I think that, quite frankly, in a, I mean that only half seriously, we can say, maybe we should say, thank you, Mr. President Putin, for reminding us that there is a need to have a vibrant and active NATO. Um, some people in Europe, and I'm sure some people in this country, were beginning to think that maybe after Afghanistan, we don't need this organization that much anymore. Thank you, Mr. President, for reminding us that it is a good idea for Europe to look at how best to diversify our energy sources. And thank you, Mr. President, for also reminding us that it is a totally essential uh, objective for the European Union to speak with one voice, not only when things are calm, but particularly at times of crises. So I believe he's giving us, I'm not, I, I, ho I, I was hoping we would not need this, but I think it was still very useful. He gave us a pretty good wake-up call. So the question is, what kind of wake-up call is it now? Secretary Hagel said what every U.S. Defense Secretary has been saying since the end of the Cold War, which is that the European countries have to spend more on defense, and instead, of course, the opposite is happening, and also in this country. Do you think there'll be any change in that dynamic, Cheryl Cross? Well, I think that, you know, when I look at this situation, to me, the wake-up call should be that uh, while we were pursuing the pivot or the rebalance toward Asia, I think the situation has only reinforced how important the relationships in Europe are for the United States, and that in, in many ways that uh, can serve as a basis and a foundation for the very turbulent and challenging world that we face. And so um, I, I think of this in terms not only of military engagement, but equally and perhaps even more important at the political, diplomatic level, engagement with societies, that this has to be a primary resource priority for the United States always. But there and is that, also a military element. Yes, of course. And, yes, and, and everybody's got to share in that burden. That's, uh, that's do you for think sure. there's any prospect that there will be any more taste, again, which we were talking about the, among the publics, for, doing, for spending more on common defense, on defense that's part of an integrated NATO complementary structure that is military? To, to have a chance for that, we need to speak about situation as a very serious but uh, when in many European countries uh, it's being neglected, uh, let's not expect that it will be convincing to the public opinion to support more spending, uh, defense spending. And that is why I believe, I really, be, I, I agree, strategy is always needed. It is uh, a matter of wisdom, common sense, and so on. But uh, we also should understand how important it is to react in a very clear, very, uh, uh, you know, tough way to what is international law crime. Uh, we, it cannot be, and, and this is not to, you know, uh, demonize Mr. Putin. It is not to humiliate Russians. It is not about that. They did something the worst what can happen in Europe. 
and that must be called that way. And we have to be consistent in that uh, political position. This is the only way also to convince our people in our countries, yes, that unfortunately, unfortunately, this is a time when we have again to spend more for defense. Mr. Kozarov, do you see any prospect that anything the West is doing right now would turn Putin from his current path in eastern Ukraine? It's not up, uh, actually it's too West uh, to, to do these things beca because, uh, you know what, uh, it's a tendency to be very dependent on the West among some of my colleagues, even from Democratic Front. It's up to us, I mean, to, 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 to Democratic forces, both in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, to stand up. But uh, to the West, uh, there is a role, uh, and there was always a, a role, as I mentioned, in our time we needed, because the oil price was so low that we, we had not uh, any kind of money they have now in Moscow. But empty promises, which we heard at our time, uh, are, were very counterproductive I'm for asking Russia. If, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we, we have to go to audience questions soon. Do you think there's anything now yes. and that can be stay, done? Stay away from empty threats. I agree with the Prime Minister. If you feel that it was aggression and you call it that way, so your words should mean something. Otherwise, it's totally counterproductive. Mm -hmm. They speak of illegal decision, for instance, of Russian parliamentaries, l Russian Duma and Russian so parliament uh, in support of what they call aggression now in the West. Yet, members of Russian parliament I will meet in Miami when I come back because they are now coming for the uh, spring vacation. So you don't go even to London. <laughs> you go to Miami, you go to New York, and you will see those people, members of the parliament. So in their either, own duchess. Exactly, the in their own villas and their own duchess, and 15 or 20 people are somehow selected under those sanctions, I don't challenge this. I don't endorse that. But what I'm saying that there should be, and I agree with Prime Minister, there should be consistency between words. If you threaten something, you do something. If you don't do, if you are not prepared to deprive yourself from the petrodollars, which I fully understand. Of course, I mean, there are billions of dollars in, in London, in New York, in Miami, in French Riviera, and people are waiting now in best restaurants for those people to come. I'm not speaking of oligarchs. I'm not speaking of businessmen. I'm not speaking of ordinary Russians, like my humble self, but I don't have millions of dollars. I'm speaking of people who actually voted. So they should have been told something consistent. If they did something wrong, and uh, you want to introduce sanctions, they should feel that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they come here, they spend we, uh, spring vacations, they come back, and what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that the West is corrupt, is probably as corrupt as anything uh, back home, and that there is no consistency, that it's empty words. And empty words are corruptive, mm -hmm. no less than empty uh, promises, and no less than absolute power, right? Those three things which corrupt. So I'm not arguing for prohibiting those people to come necessarily, but that would, of course, be very painful. And people next time, my colleagues, ex, I, I am an ex-Duma member, next time I would probably think twice whether I should vote for something or I should go to Miami, to my villa. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if the choice is not that, then you There's better, no you better, you better, uh, you better keep your opinion. I mean, you better find different words. I mean, uh, Russia at least, and Ukraine today particularly, because the blood is uh, spelled there and will be spelled more in Ukraine, unfortunately because I saw the Yugoslavian drama. It also started step by step, mm -hmm. but with Milosevic uh, 
subversive operations and then sending a little tanks and something. So that was Yugoslav ground. So unfortunately, it will be bloody. But Ukrainian people, like Russian people, they deserve at least clear message. Mm -hmm. If you are not prepared to stay away from uh, big money from Russia, be at least earnest to tell, yes, Germany wants, and Mr. Schroeder, he, ha he works for Gazprom, and he has good salary probably. I mean, people say that it's 250 uh, thousand uh, euros. For me, it would be <laughs> considerable. For Russian oligarchs, of course, it's, uh, it's not even counted anywhere. <laughs> so, so are they prepared to pay um, Mr. Schroeder? Yes. So, I mean, there should be some consistency. So I agree with the ambassador. At least it's a wake-up call to consistency. You know, uh, basically the West and the United States and Germany, they are on the, on, uh, you are on the right side of the history. I, I have to agree. And it's our problem that we cannot cope with the modern world, the Russian problem. But in tech, again, in, in s <coughs> you might call it technical terms or in day-by-day -day terms, there should be more responsibility and consistency in the West. Not necessarily do something, but if you are not prepared to do, don't say you are. Well, we haven't solved the Ukraine prop issue, uh, but I want yes, to move on to something that <laughs> Ambassador Ischinger put right on the table, which is, because we want to get to audience questions, as what does this mean? Is this a really fundamental turn or shift in the relationship of NATO with Russia, however Ukraine turns out. And I'm going to ask everyone to be somewhat brief. Jamie Shea, I'll start with you. I mean, are we going to look back and say this was one of those hinge points? Well, the, the answer is, of course, that a lot of that is going to depend on the, uh, what Russia does. It takes two to tango. Obviously, we can't dictate Russian behavior. Uh, but uh, from NATO's point of view, as I said before, we don't want to close doors. We've kept the NATO-Russia Council operational. Uh, we still want to cooperate with Russia as soon as we can, when circumstances allow, on dealing with all of the global challenges like Afghanistan or piracy in the Gulf of Aden or counterterrorism, where we've cooperated very successfully with Russia in the past. And which so is you're talking Russia's about, if I may ask, so you're talking as about compartmentalizing? As much as else. No, well, the point I'd like to make here is that, uh, obviously, in the short run, we have no choice but to sort of face this challenge. Uh, and therefore, yes, in the short term, deterrence and reassurance of uh, back to, if you like, Article 5, classic conventional defense in Europe, that has to be the priority. But uh, we are mindful here at NATO that the world is not going to stop simply because of the Ukraine crisis. Al-Qaeda hasn't sort of gone on vacation. The pirates have not gone into hibernation in the Gulf of Aden. No, uh, we don't have, uh, if you like, any less chaos in Syria or problems in the Middle East, uh, terrorism spreading across North Africa. These things are still with us, and therefore in NATO, on the one hand, yes, we have to deal with this issue of reassurance to absent member states, but on the other hand, we still have to work with our partners. Secretary Hagwood referred to this, and Prime deal Minister, with the other challenges Prime as well. Minister, what would Afghanistan you... is going to carry on as well. So we just have to be a security organization which is big enough and grown up enough to handle several problems at once. What do you think, Mr. Prime Minister, this means in terms of where NATO goes from here in dealing with Russia? Uh, no, in the future? Oh, yes. I mean, we didn't solve or even come up with a solution to Ukraine. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that uh, we will not go beyond the frozen relations. Uh, that, uh, that, that decision has been already uh, taken by NATO. And uh, there is no good answer without uh, finding answer for what I said before. Uh, we cannot simply neglect, we cannot for, uh, forget about the facts that already took place. And that is very misfortunate. I must say that I generally believe <coughs> in strategic, historical need to work together closely with Russia, that we share a lot of common interests. And I believe that the present Russian policy is suicidal. It's against strategic interests of Russia. And I would like to, to overcome that situation. But unfortunately, there are some conditions that must be fulfilled by them. 
they have to get out of Ukraine. They have to stop interfering with domestic affairs of other countries. You should not forget that in Europe we have elaborated special regulations, procedures guaranteeing the rights of minorities in Council of Europe and so on and so on. So Russia, if has, uh, if has believes, has reasons to complain, should go to European institutions and defend Russian-speaking minorities, etc. But uh, uh, as I said, uh, we cannot accept the, 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 the factual, actual situation in, in Ukraine. And I don't, do not know what is the solution for that. Because uh, Mr. Putin announced a historical, strategic new doctrine, and it, uh, uh, stepping back, of course, will mean his total failure. And I do not expect that in, sh in short period of time. We have also to address ordinary Russians, to make something, to change the, the, that uh, chauvinistic enthusiasm now shared by the vast majority of the population. It reminds the worst scenes from history of Europe, from the 20th century. And they should understand that it always ended in total catastrophe of those states and those uh, nations. Cheryl Cross, you wanted to jump in here. Well, I think we have some historical precedent. If you look back in terms of periods of tension between NATO and Russia, and it was most serious during the conflict in former Yugoslavia and during the Russian-Georgian War in 2008. And those were very difficult periods during the war with Georgia. There were discussions all over the capitals in Europe and in the United States and Russia that we may have gone, returned to a Cold War or be returning to another Cold War. And we managed to move past those periods because of a vast array of critical shared security interests. Uh, Ukraine is more serious. This is a more difficult situation. The stakes for Russia, for one thing, are much greater in the Ukrainian case. But I'm hopeful, and when I hear Jamie Shea say that we need to pursue all these consultative bodies, discussion opportunities in the NATO-Russia Council to continue to try to engage and work through these problems with Russia, Russia's uh, position in Europe and global security is critical. I think they are a major power, and it's important that we understand some of the other st major strategic issues that are at stake in this relationship, in arms control, in counterterrorism, weapons proliferation, regional conflicts, the, the future of the circumstances in the Middle East, and the, the continued outcome from the revolutions uh, taking place in that, that area. And if we have the United States, Europe, and Russia working in a competitive or uh, uh, enemy sort of approach in dealing with those situations, I think it could be very grim for the future. So it's worth trying. It won't be easy. We should expect setbacks, but we have to keep, I think, a long-term vision and not look at this just in terms of the short-term and immediate. I don't think it's in the interest of any of our nations to see the return of a Cold War. So I'm not hearing anyone use the term containment yet. I'm hearing some elements of that. For instance, that Europe should diversify its energy sources, that ways should be found to not need Russia so much. What would you say to that, Ambassador Ischinger? I mean, do, do, do you think something fundamental is happening here? Or is this just, I, I say this with no disrespect, another Georgia Ossetia situation where after a year or so we look the other way and move on? That it's just not top of maybe the we Western agenda. Maybe we didn't take uh, events in Georgia seriously enough, but that's a question also for historians to, to, to take a look at. My own view is that what we are seeing is a policy of revisionism. That's what you call that. You know, placing in question uh, what is. Essentially, I learned uh, uh, that there are two kinds of leaders um, in the world. So there's, there's one category of leaders that takes what is and tries to create a better future. Good example of that is Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, who built from a swamp town an international hub called, you know, Singapore. Um, if German leaders post-war <laughs> had behaved or were behaving now in the way the current Russian leadership is behaving, we would still be, you know, fighting with Poland over Silesia. We would be fighting with France over uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And we would claim that some Poles who speak German are actually Germans and deserve the protection 
of the German armed forces if something uh, happens in Poland that we don't like. I mean, this is chaos. This is awful. So, you know, I'm not one who is going to try to minimize the dimensions of the problem that we're facing. But I also totally agree with Andrei Kozirev. I hope everybody listens to when he speaks about how important consistency is. Consistency is very close to credibility. And <coughs> whatever we say ha has got to match with what we do. I, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, in response to your question, what about NATO? Uh, well, we are going to need to take a fresh look at how important the core function of NATO is to our countries. The core function, namely collective defense, had gotten more or less um, forgotten mm -hmm. a little bit because we thought it was no longer really necessary. We used to say Germany was surrounded by friends and now everything is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously we need to take a fresh look because Poland is our immediate neighbor, part of our club, of our union. And if Poland has a border with Ukraine and if there is chaos in Ukraine and beyond, it's, it affects our very own security and that of all of NATO and of the EU as well. So yes, I think there must be um, a comprehensive review of our priorities, both in the EU and in NATO. But let's not do it, if I may say so, with foam foaming at the mouth. Let's do it, you know, cool. And let's do it also always in, with having in mind consistency. And on that thought, we're going to questions from the audience. And there are people with roving mics. And I'll start right here because you're closest to the aisle. And if you just briefly give your name and affiliation and you know the rules, a question, not a statement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Arwan Lagadek from George Washington University. Uh, we've talked about Georgia a couple of times. Particularly uh, in uh, April of 2008, the, the Bucharest uh, NATO summit decided to not extend uh, a membership action plan to Ukraine and Georgia. And within four months, uh, Georgia w w was invaded. Uh, and there was a sense that I, with, hi with hands, uh, hindsight, you know, the, the word wisdom has been uh, spoken a number of times today. W w is your view that the decision at Bucharest uh, in 2008 not to extend uh, a, m a membership action plan to Ukraine and Georgia was unwise? Thanks. Oh, who would like to take that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and just to get to all the questions, maybe does someone want to volunteer? To take that, Jamie. Oh, we lost Jamie Shea. I'm sorry. The question was so difficult. Yeah, well, they're replacing the call. Um, but uh, well, Ambassador I can take that. Yes, why don't you take? I can take that, that question. Oh, uh, Jamie, I was Shea, actually, Jamie Shea, did you hear the question? Yeah. Was it a mistake? I, I did, and I, I, I did hear the question, Margaret. Yes. Okay, and I'm going to ask everyone to give fairly brief answers, just because we have a lot of hands up. So was it a mistake not to take in Georgia and uh, Ukraine in 2008? Well, no. I mean, again, you can't take in countries that are not ready for membership. And Georgia and uh, Ukraine were then and still now uh, still in preparation for membership. And that work uh, continues. Uh, what NATO has not done in the wake of the crisis is, is first of all, lift the offer uh, to Georgia on ultimate NATO membership if Georgia meets the conditions. But I think, you know, lumping Ukraine and Georgia together is wrong because for some considerable time already, uh, Ukraine has made it clear that it's not seeking NATO uh, membership. Uh, even in the present crisis, it hasn't renewed uh, uh, a request for NATO membership. And sometimes I'm mystified when the Russians always talk about NATO as if we're actively sort of seeking to embrace Ukraine as a member as quickly as possible. That, that, that's not the case. We're continuing to work with Georgia. Uh, but uh, as I say, there's a deliberate process of preparation that has to go through, uh, that Georgia has to, to go through. No, I don't believe that the NATO decision uh, uh, was the reason, it, unless uh, uh, the Russians at the time, and President Putin, like often when citing NATO enlargement, want to use it as some kind of alibi or some kind of justification or some kind of smokescreen for simply carrying out sort of real politic designs, which were already uh, there. It's a very convenient political football in Russia. It's a good excuse. But whether that's the real strategic motivation, I have my doubts. Yes, right here, sir, in the red and blue tie. Thank you. I'm Benjamin Tour, a retired American diplomat. Uh, my question goes to Ambassador 
uh, Issinger's uh, opening remarks in which he talked about the dire consequences of not having had NATO expansion. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that suggests a lack of confidence in the ability of the West to muster sufficient economic assistance and investment to integrate and develop these economies of Eastern Europe with a spillover to the countries of the uh, former so Soviet Union. Uh, that seems to me the real tragedy, wouldn't you agree? And your emphasis on massive uh, economic assistance for Ukraine now uh, means that we've learned the lesson, uh, but perhaps a bit late. Thank you. Do you want to comment on that? I can be very brief. Um, yes, I, I, would, I would tend to agree with you. And mind you, I don't speak on behalf of the German government here. Don't, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I speak as a private citizen. I believe we did not pay enough attention to also financially and economically to the uh, challenges of our eastern neighbors. We should have probably acted long before Russia started to think about uh, Crimea or long before the Maidan began to explode about how to help stabilize a country that, that has had a history now for two decades of not really making its way forward as, as we were hoping to. Um, what was the other part of your question? I think I think the emphasis was on NATO expansion rather than together, but that was essentially it. Yeah, yeah, okay, I think that does. So the gentleman in the blue sweater. Daniele Moro Science University. Uh, the question is on the twenty fifth of May we will have the European elections. On the same day the Ukrainians are supposed to have the referendum. Uh, and presidential how, elections. How, presidential how election. do you think we could help them just to have free elections in all of Ukraine with this situation? If I may say. Yes. I believe that, uh, uh, that we can ver do very little about Eastern Ukraine because, of course, uh, the uh, security situation will... Uh, uh, decide about the uh, possibility to have uh, any kind of elections there or not. And, uh, in my opinion, in fact, this is one of the targets of uh, that inter kind of hidden intervention, not to allow to have uh, elections a at all, then to have a kind of pretext uh, to question the results of uh, elections in, in, in general. But in the rest of Ukraine, uh, it has been already s decided that there will be a lot of observers from uh, European institutions uh, and I personally do not have any doubts that uh, we can expect fair elections. Uh, yes, right here, the gentleman, and, and then and then the uh, lady behind him. Uh, hi, I'm Iris Strauss, Committee on Eastern Europe and Russia in NATO. Uh, Minister Kozirov, when you first became foreign minister of the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, uh, one of your speeches was here in Washington at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which I had the honor of hearing you at, and you laid out your plans so that if the Soviet Union were unfortunately to break up, you would prevent it from becoming a nuclear Yugoslavia and a terrible set of civil wars. And I was stunned that you could imagine to achieve uh, peace in such conditions, and I was more stunned that you did achieve it. And I think the entire world and the Russian people owe you a great debt of gratitude for that achievement, and you are not as honored as you well deserved. Uh, and history should note your important role, especially now when Mr. Putin is beginning to assume the role of a Milosevic and undo the tremendous work you did for your people. That's not my question, but I do think we, d <laughs> I do think we deserve, <laughs> you deserve that honor and appreciation. My question is about the lack of deeds connected with words that you've brought up. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev, when he was still president, was discussing the unification of Germany. I'm not going to talk about the myth that we promised NATO would never move east. Uh, Ambassador Matlock has already refuted that. It's a lie. But Gorbachev did raise the question, well, shouldn't Russia join NATO also? And James Baker poo-pooed him. And in one of the great acts of a statesman, 
Admitting having made a mistake, James Baker later regretted that and said he should not have done that. He should have engaged Gorbachev on that question. Uh, one of the first acts of so the Yeltsin government in December 1991 was to raise the question of NATO membership. The foreign ministry later said it was a mistranslation, but foreign ministry officials assured me that, it, in fact, it was a true translation. They just had to withdraw it because it became such a political embarrassment for Yeltsin and for you personally. I am wondering how much damage has been done by our lack of engagement with Russia on the question of a serious integration of Russia and its interests with NATO. It's to you, sir. Uh, first of all, I cannot agree more on your statement. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, I ag uh, agree with the uh, assumption of your question, yes. That's the point, and that's where I technically agree and I see the point uh, of, pre of Putin when he says that uh, we had kind of, uh, what was it, uh, unclear. I would put it in a way, if you read my memoirs, if somebody publishes my memoirs, <laughs> you will find it. Uh, no, no, uh, actually, because uh, I am pro-Western in terms that I want Russia become a Western democracy, not only Russian elite going to London or Miami, but uh, in, as a diplomat, as a, in, in a practitioner, I met with a lot of confusing signals from NATO all the time. And even Prime Minister said that, that's very interesting, the Prime Minister said that they believed that a partnership for peace was instead of membership. If they believed that in Poland, how much in Russia, in Kremlin, uh, especially hardliners tended to believe it when so-called declaration was signed by my successor, Mr. Primakov, who was, of course, old KGB hand and, and still is. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, he is, uh, I mean, um, by that time, everything was lost. I mean, every opportunity, the window was closed uh, for domestic reasons. Uh, but he believed that when he signed this uh, fig leaf um, declaration on NATO-Russian partnership in 1997, 1998, which NATO applauded for, he actually came home and said publicly that they promised him that underlying under this declaration was the promise of NATO not to expand to form a Soviet space, that is, Baltic states. So uh, President Putin, who still has Primakov as his, I think, as his advisor, he tended to believe that he was deceived by that declaration. There is no, we could not find any record of any promises to Gorbachev uh, that NATO would not expand, for instance, to Eastern Germany. Uh, we could not find, maybe if somebody f uh, find it, but w we have no records, uh, we had no records of that. But Gorbachev apparently seems to believe still today that he had such a promise. And President Yeltsin believed that he had a promise uh, and the detail how he was led to believe that that partnership for peace was instead of NATO enlargement, not a first step, not a preparatory step, which I knew because um, uh, Talbot and um, Christopher and uh, my Western European colleagues spent time to explain that to me while they failed to tell that to President Putin, uh, to President Yeltsin at that time. So, that brings me back to, to my point. It's not enough for the West to be on the right side of history. It's, it's important. But they should uh, speak in clear terms. That's what Russians deserve. That's what Putin deserves. That's what a Russian parliament deserves. That's what Ukrainian people in particular today, because they are suffering 
they are in, 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 in the war, actually. So they deserve very, very clear message. Uh, and the message which meets the ends, because somebody whispers something to somebody, you know? Somebody hints that, yes, we will go very far in, 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 in giving you protection from uh, whatever there is, subversive operations, and, uh, and if that does not happen, that might spell in blood, because people start fighting, believing that there is somebody behind them. Like those so-called pro-Russian uh, militia, they are fighting there, believing that the Red Army stands ready on the border, which is probably true. So, and the, I tend to believe that it's true. Uh, so, uh, that's one thing. The other thing, if you promise something to people and then you fail, better not promise. They will do it themselves. I'm pretty sure that Russian people haven't said its final word yet. There will be a democratic revolution or, de or, or continuation of democratic process in Russia sooner or later, maybe after the um, oil oil pr prices uh, go a little bit down because petro dollars could buy everything including uh, former chancellors. Uh, <laughs> so I think we have time so, for one. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, yes, okay. we will do it ourselves but don't deceive people. All right and so I think we have time I was going to say for one but let's take two and um, if you both ask your question and we'll get the panel to adjust. So the young lady there and then the l woman here in blue. So my name is Laura Marsalisi and I'm Can a you hold your mic closer, please? At Thanks. U.S. Azari Network. So my question is, you know, in light of the Ukraine cross it, Ukrainian crisis, it has pointed to the weakness in the security plan of the West and of NATO, and it has also indicated that Russia still has influence in many of the countries in the Caucasus and Eastern Europe. So in light of that, what should NATO do to ensure the uh, ensure and reinforce the territorial integrity of countries like Ukraine, um, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Moldova, who have all proven that they are, in fact, NATO allies. And we'll take the second question as well. Marisa Lino mm -hmm. with Northrop Grumman Corporation. Uh, apparently, Russia has called for a UN Security Council meeting today mm -hmm. to discuss Ukraine. My question is very simple. What can they hope to gain from uh, this move? Apparently, the U.S. doesn't support it. Who would like to tackle these two questions first? Okay, Jamie? Uh, yeah, on the first question, uh, first of all, we have to be clear. Uh, when it comes to NATO, the collective security guarantee, the Article 5, applies to NATO members, which, of course, is why countries have to uh, join NATO in order to uh, have that. So uh, Ukraine is not a NATO ally. It's true, it's a partner, and a very close partner, and in fact, it's participated in nearly all of NATO, in fact, all of NATO's operations, including Afghanistan. And therefore, we're treating that partnership seriously. As I said in answer to a previous question, we've got teams at the moment in uh, Ukraine, we're helping them with defense reform, uh, defense restructuring, uh, with reform of the intelligence services, and all the kind of things Wolfgang Ischengil was pointing to that we need to do to help make Ukraine a more resilient state. We've got a very strong partnership with Georgia. Uh, the ambassadors of the North Atlantic Council were all in Tbilisi uh, recently. We're helping Moldova. We're upgrading relations with Azerbaijan. So those partners, in fact, are receiving assistance from NATO. But we have to be clear, uh, the Article 5 obligation extends only to mm -hmm. uh, NATO allies. And that's what we're doing when it comes to the reassurance uh, uh, package. Uh, but of course, uh, just one other Thank point, Russia also has to play a role in reassuring the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. When just coming back to what Mr. Kozirev was saying a moment ago, just if I may very briefly, because this is my last intervention, the more President Yeltsin used to threaten these countries with uh, regarding the consequences of NATO membership, the more he made it clear that their sovereignty in terms of what they were able to do was limited, that Russia had to have a say in their security affairs, the more it drove them into the arms of, 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 of NATO, the more they became worried and became even more determined to seek NATO membership. So, you know, if Russia wants a stable NATO, it doesn't only have to see that in terms of either you are a vassal or you are an enemy. It has to adopt a modern approach to security as well and play its part in reassurance. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not what President Putin is doing in the current crisis. 
Investor Ischinger. Just very briefly, uh, as a footnote to uh, Jamie's uh, reply, in my view, what Russia has been doing in recent days and weeks is not really a demonstration of Russian strength. It is more, to me, a demonstration of Russian weakness. Think for a moment what Russia has already lost, colossal loss, loss of trust uh, by all its neighbors. If President Putin believes that this is the way for him to build the Eurasian Union of which he dreams, well, you know, good luck. I imagine that President Aliyev in Azerbaijan and many others uh, who are leading countries um, neighboring to Russia will now think again how to buy some kind of reinsurance against possible Russian uh, ambitions. So I think in terms of um, Russian strategy, I am not impressed that this is uh, an expression of strength. I believe it is really weakening Russia, of course also because of the rather disastrous economic consequences which these actions are going to produce. Mm -hmm. And I think just because we have to end it now, I'll just address your question about the meeting that Russia's called for. Uh, I have no idea. I haven't checked my BlackBerry or my iPhone in the last hour. But, you know, I think we saw at the Geneva meeting, I mean, Russia will participate and perhaps even help instigate certain diplomatic uh, uh, meetings and discussions and even agreements. And, you know, it's a, I think it's an open question right now about the level of sincerity or whether that's simply a diversion or a way of uh, uh, keeping, staying engaged in the conversation while continuing to do what it, it wants to on the ground. I know that is now a growing feeling within, certainly after the failure of Geneva, after the failure of the Syria peace talks, that uh, in the administration, I'm not speaking for myself, but just from people I've interviewed and talked to there, that there is a sense that, that uh, some of these are feints and, and simply maneuvers, and that meanwhile, uh, Russia continues to create effects on the ground. So well, I want to thank our terrific panel, uh, with so many different perspectives here, and uh, really added so a great deal to this conversation. And thank you all for your questions, and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it.